We came here looking for the seat of Hugh Montgomery Brayston Castle, and the castle's gone. Um, but remarkably, these are the stones that made the castle. It fell down in 1800. They were then used to build a byre, and now have been converted into a house. So hopefully, these are the stones that witness the deal between Con O'Neill and Sir Hugh Montgomery. So what did become of Thomas, Annas, and the deal between my ancestor and the Gaelic chieftain? By now, Thomas Montgomery and Annas were both in love, and later they were married. Con O'Neill and Hugh Montgomery, meanwhile, had hammered out a deal that they were both happy with and were headed south to London to get the go-ahead from King James. Everything was going according to plan. Little did Montgomery know that he wasn't the only Ayrshire landowner and friend of the king who was turning his attention across the Irish Sea. Having been educated at St Andrews and taken up a position as a teacher in Glasgow, James Hamilton had gone on to gain a strong foothold in Dublin. He worked as a Latin schoolmaster in the grammar school here in Dublin and then when the new college, Trinity College Dublin, was founded uh, by Queen Elizabeth in 1592, he became one of the first fellows and then played a very important role in setting the college up. But Hamilton's arrival in 1587 may have been nothing more than pure accident due to a storm blowing his ship off course from Scotland. Sir James Hamilton arrives in Dublin and there are two stories about this. One says that he was actually, you know, happened to be sailing down the Irish Sea and a storm blew him into Dublin. And by, almost by accident, he becomes, you know, King James's agent in Dublin, as you do, by accident, you know. But the other version of it is that, in fact, he was al almost sent as like, a, like an 007 of his age. He was actually sent on a mission to Dublin deliberately. Of course, Montgomery knew nothing of this as he made his way south to see the king. Montgomery arrived here at London's Hampton Court Palace, the seat of English power, to stake his claim. But he was about to discover the hard way that there are friends of the king, and then there are very good friends of the king. And James Hamilton was definitely one of the latter. In fact, towards the end of Elizabeth's reign, Hamilton and his cohorts had kept themselves extremely busy spying on the Queen's activities in Ireland, even tampering with the Royal Mail to keep King James and themselves carefully informed. James Hamilton plays a very important role here because letters are being sent to, uh, from England to Scotland about the succession to the English throne. And a lot of these letters are sent via James Hamilton in Dublin. As Scottish agent to the English court of Elizabeth, Hamilton had been ideally placed to play a vital role in helping King James VI of Scotland become King James I of Scotland, England and Ireland. Having worked hard to earn himself more than a little influence with the new king, Hamilton now intended to put that influence to good use. Instead of halving the O'Neill estate, he suggested dividing it three ways. O'Neill would get to keep a mere third of his land, with Montgomery and now Hamilton each getting an equal slice of the remainder. Montgomery was apoplectic, but there was nothing he could do. The king had already given his assent. And whether Montgomery liked it or not, Hamilton was part of the deal, and from that day forward, the two men were bitter rivals. Soon after that, Montgomery received a knighthood from King James. Perhaps it was an attempt to sweeten the deal, but whatever the case, it must have worked as negotiations continued and preparations were made to begin the establishment of the new settlements. But then something happened that could have ruined everything. Fifth of November, 1605. And Guy Fawkes's gunpowder plot to blow up the Houses of Parliament was foiled. Had it been successful, the course of history would have been changed forever. For one thing, if James I's reign had been cut short, the Ulster Scott settlement would never have gone ahead as planned. As it turned out, however, while Fawkes and his gang waited to be hung, drawn and quartered for treason, Hamilton and Montgomery made their separate ways back across the Irish Sea to begin a new life. Hamilton and Montgomery took a chance coming to Ireland. The waters between Scotland and Ireland were actually infested by pirates. So in fact, they could have been basically hijacked or, or, or their goods could have been stolen. And Ireland was also affected by plague. 
you see you had a prolonged period of warfare uh, and, that, and there was plague and pestilence. Uh, there were wolves in Ireland at the time. So, you know, they weren't coming to somewhere that was sort of virgin territory and it was all good times. You know, and they're here, it's a gravy drain and people didn't have to work hard. The reality is it was a dangerous situation for them and they were speculators and they took a chance. Both Hamilton and Montgomery arrived in Ulster in November 1605 and each sent word back to their clansmen, their friends, their family, encouraging them to join them in their new settlements. Although their journey was a short one, the new settlers must have felt they were arriving in a new world. The western lowlands of Scotland had become largely overcrowded, leading to higher rents and frequent skirmishes over territory. By contrast, East Ulster was a war-wasted and devastated region with a population of just two and a half thousand. Hugh Montgomery set up his first home here in Donaghadee, whereas James Hamilton chose Bangor, further up the coast, for his base. The first wave of settlers arrived in May 1606 to begin cultivating the land, building homes and churches, and generally transforming their surroundings in order to support the new communities. From the vantage point offered by Scrabo Tower, near Newtonards, where Montgomery later settled, Dr. William Ralston of the Ulster Historical Foundation 